Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. We are going to be today continuing our look at the channelings of Tom Kenyon of the Octurian in the Octurian Anthology. And as most of you know, we are in the middle of Actara, an Octurian named Actara's channeling. If this is your first time on the channel, welcome. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad that you have an interest in this type of off-worldly information you don't necessarily have to start at the very beginning you can probably listen to this and get a lot from it but if you are interested in hearing all of the channelings that we previously covered that is in the playlist called understanding the magdalene which will be down in the description box below we also have in that playlist the sophia code megan waterson's commentary on magdalene's missing gospel we have the magdalene manuscript as well as the hathor material so i hope that you enjoy all of those and they're just as impactful on on you as they have been on me and of course other people in this community so today we're going to be looking we're going to be starting on page 84 on Akhtara's. he's going to be speaking i'm really excited to see what he has to say because today we're going to be talking about the soul and we're also going to cover something about angels i haven't read too far for it i just skimmed it a little bit so i'm really excited to get discussing this so all right with that being said let's get started in our experience of ourselves and many other beings but not all we possess a point of energy that is indestructible except under the direst of circumstances when we physically die this point of energy this spark continues on but it does not continue with personal identity yep it is as if the quintessence the di distillation of all our experiences is reduced to a singularity so boom 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 we've talked about this so much on my channel which this is basically spirituality 101 so if you're really new to spirituality which i understand that there are a lot of people that are very new right now to true spirituality which is very different from religion okay this is this is 101 okay so you have the soul and you have the human experience two different things and according to the yoga sutras of patanjali this is the crux of man's suffering so man thinks that he is his identity so for me i in my human condition i believe that i am bryce and this is who i am eternally no i'm a soul and all the experiences i have in this body as bryce is a way for my soul to know itself through the suffering of the human experience as my friend cindy says without suffering there is no mystic right because suffering is if, if everything's just fine and hunky-dory all the time then we don't question things but when things when suffering comes around that's when we start to question what is the point of life right and as, as i've said this before it's like when, when we look at all the lives that we have lived because energy cannot be created nor destroyed it can only be transmuted so therefore that's the biggest proof of reincarnation that we just keep coming back it's like going into amusement park right so like here in georgia we have six flags it's like when you go into this amusement park you have all these different rides and these different rides are going to simulate a different experience on purpose you are picking when you get in line to take the batman ride or the superman ride or splash mountain you are making the choice the free will choice to have that particular experience or if you want to go into the haunted house you you have that choice that free will choice to get in that line and take that experience sometimes i feel like planet earth is the haunted house of the amusement park that we all decided to, to get in line for and by through having that experience your adrenaline starts to kick in you then experience the information you need in that simulation if that makes sense and so through the experience of life the soul can know itself but the soul is not the life right so people ask me all the time about like and i've covered bloodlines I, I definitely you know like i'm o negative so there are different personality traits and different experiences to an o negative person and there is to like an a positive so your bloodline your blood type has nothing to do with the value of your soul it's just an experience your race your gender none of this has anything to do with the value of your soul because your soul is none of those things right so so that's what he's saying here it's, it's just being reiterated over and over and over again and i think that you know especially in religion we get so caught up into the identity of our religion and that's the exact opposite of what spirituality is trying to teach us spirituality is trying to remind you that you are a soul 
having a human experience. You are not a human being searching for a spiritual experience. You already are the spiritual experience having a human experience. And because you understand, as, as it says in the Emerald Tablets, because you are a human that will eventually have this experience come to an end, to a conclusion through what we call death, then only then can you as the soul experience life, right? Because the soul is eternal. You can't kill a soul. The only thing that's going to perish one day is the mortality of the body. But because that exists, you're able to use the nervous system to experience life. I hope that makes sense. So if people who are new to spirituality, that, that, is, that is the one thing you need to really focus on. Past lives, yes, again, we do have past lives. We live many lives. The most important experience you're in right now is the one you're in right now. And so the past lives, if you're spending so much time trying to figure out who you were in the past, then you're trying to escape something in the now that your soul needs to experience, okay? So don't worry about spirituality isn't known on your past life. Spirituality is not reading tarot cards or divination. That's just communication. That's no different than picking up the phone and calling someone. Spirituality is under understanding who you are as a spirit, your own spirituality. So that is the, the starting point is understanding you are not your identity. Your identity is just the Batman ride. It's just Splash Mountain of this life. And once you can make peace with that, once you can go through the ego death that's associated with that, then you can really start to enjoy the experience of Splash Mountain, the life you're in. The Batman ride. I hope that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense, ask me questions in the comment section below and we can go through that even more. He goes on to say, this moves for some time through space or in the higher dimensional realities where a dis decision is made by the individual to re-enter and experience a life or not. By this, I mean we can choose to incarnate into a body in any of the dimensional realities. So again, dimensional realities and density are two very different things. Dimensional is consciousness, density is the nature. So we're in third density right now, moving to fourth density. The consciousness could be fifth dimensional, but there are a lot of people out there claiming they're already in the fifth dimensional realities and they surely are not. All right, that's the trick of the ego. So the a good thing about spirituality too, true spirituality is teaching you a sense of humility. And once again, if you're confused by what I am saying, when I talk about dimensions, I would highly suggest, once again, reading the raw material. I will put uh, our, my episode I did with Catherine Edwards and Mr. Fox over the law of one raw material that will get more into it. But don't be duped, guys. Like if, if you're new to spirituality, there's a lot of fake spirituality out there. Please don't be duped. There's a lot of fake spirituality in our community and the great awakening that through their community, 99% 0.9% of the people out there claiming to be all spiritual. They're not. They're duping you. They're con men. So just be very careful with that kind of stuff. We can choose, but whether it happens or not is affected by many factors. We have to possess the quality of the dimension that we wish to move into as an embodied being. Raw, the law material calls this harvesting, graduating. You can't just say, I'm going to go to the seventh dimension now. No, you have to actually qualify. It's like college. Again, Go back, read the law of one to understand what they're talking about. So we have to have developed the higher attributes when we were alive, if we wish to incarnate into a higher dimensional of reality after our death. We observe something similar occurring with human beings. Many traditions and religions speak of the soul. And our experience is that there is no such thing as the totality of the individual surviving death and moving forward or backward into dimensional reality but there is an energy point or spark that continues on. The question is what of what you might call fields of possibility. So that makes sense too. So I use the word soul um, when I am on YouTube because I statistically have more Westerners watching my YouTube channel. And, um, but if you are familiar with Eastern philosophy and spirituality, you know that it's not really the soul. There can, you can possess many souls within you. Because the soul is also like the essence of the experience. It's the Atman. So if you get really into deep Eastern philosophy, it's more the Atman of the person, which is deeper than the soul. It's the watching. It's the watcher. So I kind of get what he's saying here because that goes back again to, and I, I, again, I don't really get into much. I don't specify that too much on my channel because I don't want to confuse people because so many people are really new to this concept. And so soul is the vocabulary word that most Westerners are familiar with. So that's what I typically use. But yes, if you do go into a deeper field of study, 
when it comes to Eastern philosophy, you are going to run across this idea of an Ottoman, which is something, and that that is truly what I do believe deep down is more of an Ottoman. Um, but again, I just pick my battles on YouTube because I know I know that most people in the West are not familiar with this term. Hope that makes sense. But we can, if you guys want, we can do a video kind of explaining the differences between the two if, if you want. And I think sometimes when people in the West refer to their soul, they are actually meaning the Atman. They just don't don't realize that's what they're meaning. All right. The soul, as many human beings understand it, carries with it personal history and identity. See, exactly, yes. So the soul is the essence of the experience, but the Atman is the thing watching the experience. We do not experience this as we view humans going through the death process, but we do experience an energy pointer spark surviving death without personal history and without personal identity. So that's a really good explanation of the difference between the soul and the Atman. So let me reread that again. The soul, as many human beings understand it, carries with it personal history and identity. We do not experience this as we view humans going through the death process, but we do experience an energy point or spark surviving death without personal history and without personal identity. So as he's saying here, the soul is something with personal history and personal identity. The Atman, however, is something without personal history and without personal identity. It just is. The essence of that lifetime in terms of its vibratory nature is distilled into an essence that is encompassed by the spark or the energy point. So this point has a type of magnetic attraction to the vibratory level or dimensional reality that matches what was developed. This is why we Octurians prefer to extend our lives as long as possible. And we develop the re-genesis technology to aid us in this. And this is a good point of point to talk about this as well. I, I said earlier that there's a lot of scam artists out there in spirituality. Thoth has spoken about this in the Emerald Tablets. Multiple, the half lore spoke about this. Um, multiple different lineages of spirituality speak about this. Now, the reason why I have such an in-depth understanding is because I have been studying this for 17 years. So, um, the Emerald Tablets, as well as many other works, say that you need to be a student for at least 10 to 15 years of a specific lineage in order to then have any credence in teaching it or healing or working with others to heal others. This includes Reiki. This includes Tai Chi. So, when you are going about this world, trying to find healers, trying to find teachers, the first thing you should ask somebody is, who is their teacher and what lineage do they practice under? Again, this has to do with any quantum healing. There needs to be an actual lineage that they're working from. And my friend Emmy and I, Emmy just got a new puppy. So, so that's why she's been absent for a little bit. We, but we're actually planning on doing a show on this about how you can vet, right? Go through a vetting process when it comes to who you're having assist you in your spiritual progress, whether that's, again, through a light worker, a healer, or a teacher. Um, there needs to be many, many years of study and apprenticeship under that person's belt. So I started seriously practicing yoga 17 years ago, and I started going to India eight years ago. So when I first started practicing yoga, I, cu I couldn't qualify. I had to have years of, of, of constant tutelage under a, a qualified teacher. And that was David Grieg for me in order for me to even qualify to get into the school in India. So almost like a university, it's like if you want to be a doctor, you can't just go to med school, right? You have to go to undergrad first, go pre-med. Then you have to take the MCATs to actually get into med school. Or if you want to be a lawyer, you have to go pre-law and undergrad and then take the LSATs to get into law school. It's the same thing. Okay. It's the same thing with Reiki. It's the same thing with all these in, very old lineages. There is a system and the system is very important in my opinion, because it's going to weed out people who are scam artists. Someone who's looking to scam you are not going to invest the time in their own study it's 17 years of like, most of that time. I wasn't making money as a teacher. I was a student, right? And scam artists don't have time for that, right? Especially if they're charismatic and can like dupe you into like paying them extraordinary amount of money. So for me, I'm the only female authorized KPJ authorized teacher in, in the state of, of Georgia. 
If you want to take a private lesson with me for an hour, I'm $200 an hour. That's about average for my level of, which I'm one, at one of the highest levels, right? So if somebody is charging you thousands of dollars for a service, you're being scammed. Unless it's like a full on course. If you're taking a full on course for many, many, many weeks, I mean, the yoga and Reiki intensive that um, Emmy and I do together. It's many weeks. We only charge 500 and that's split between the two of us. Okay. So that's another thing. If you are going to be taking a course for someone, having somebody work on you, be their student, you need to ask them who they're, to, who are they accountable to? So I'm accountable. Even though I'm an authorized teacher, I have to be accountable to KPJY and Mysore India. I have a teacher there that has authorized me. I had to sign a contract, understanding certain, I had certain boundaries, ethical boundaries, all right. So you, you have every right to ask that person who is their teacher. You have every right to ask that person to see their paperwork showing their authorization or whatever they call it in their lineage. You also need to ask that person how many years they've been studying this. You have a right to know this if you're going to have this person come on and work on you. Okay. So that's just a little little piece of advice, take it or leave it. But that's just some really practical advice when you are looking for spiritual teachers and healers. All right. So let's go into electromagnetic intelligence. In your ancient history and mythology, ancient cultures interacted with these higher electromagnetic intelligences. And again, to clarify the terminology, by higher electromagnetic intelligence, we simply mean electromagnetic entity that exist in a higher vibratory rate than humans. Let us look at the electromagnetic spectrum through the lens of ultraviolet light. There are beings that can reside in the X-ray spectrum or the gamma ray spectrum. Early in prehistoric culture, especially in the early mythologies of cultures like Greece, there was an acceptance of otherworldly beings. They took the form of mythological figures, many of them animal in nature, this knowledge of the existence of electromagnetic intelligence exists in every culture of, of the planet. Yep. We also see it in the Hindu mythology. There's a lot of um, Hindu avatars that are animal-like, like Hanuman is monkey, Ganesh is, um, well, has the head of an elephant, the body of a boy, but, but yeah, so absolutely. Thus, in the various cultures of the world, you have descriptions of fairies, gnomes, leprechauns, nymphs, Pegasus and centaurs and a host of otherworldly forms. These were the result of encounters between physically aware humans and these higher electromagnetic intelligences. In some cases, the form as perceived by the human was an accurate or close to accurate impression. But in most cases, the impression was colored by the expectation and belief of the human. But the reality of the higher electromagnetic intelligence exists independently of the impressions received. Yeah, I mean, that's the same thing with humans, right? People, I mean, listen, that's something I've had to learn being on YouTube. People have a perceived opinion of me just because they see me on their computer screen, which I'm so grateful you watch. But most of the time, it's probably what I am like in real life probably isn't what you perceive me to be. Okay, so he goes on to say this once again, an expression of the re re reality of perception and this especially applies when a being of a lower vibra vibratory reality interacts with beings from a higher vibratory reality. So the next section is angels. Since we are on the topic, I would like to address the phenomenon of angels from our viewpoint. Angels exist. They are benevolent and well-intended. They are higher electromagnetic intelligences, however. When a human encounters one of these benevolent, well-intended intelligences, the human may very well filter the experience through his or her expectation or belief. But furthermore, a point I wish to make in this discussion is yes, these angels are benevolent and well-intended, but some are more intelligent than others, and some are more masterful at creating results. I have a Huge loving relationship with Archangel Michael, so I get this. The difficulty as I view it regarding the topic of angels is that the concept is burdened and tainted by religious and spiritual dogma and misconceptions. It is a wonderful experience to encounter a benevolent, intelligent, and masterful higher electromagnetic intelligence. 
This can be a deeply rewarding experience for both the human and the electromagnetic entity. But the human must be aware that the burden of the responsibility for what he or she extracts from the experience is upon the human. And so if you interact with an angel, keep your wits about you. And if the angel tells you that you must do something, then you are either dealing with an idiot or a malevolent entity cloaked as a benevolent one. I agree with that because I, I, I see angels. I've seen Michael my whole life. I talked to Magdalene. Not once have they ever instructed me to do anything, especially if it's something I don't want to do or something that's going to harm myself or another person. And so if you're seeing a being that is telling you to do something that you're not comfortable with or is telling you to hurt somebody else or yourself, it's not a being. It's, 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 a, it's a malevolent being trying to trick you. So just be aware of that. In fact, Michael nor Magdalene have really ever told me to do anything. I mean, Magdalene, I think this series was inspired by Magdalene, but they've never forced me. If I had said, no, I don't want to do it, they would have been like, that's cool. You know, like, or Magdalene would have been like, that's cool if I said I don't want to do the playlist, you know? So, so um, yeah, that's that's something really good to know. Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa has spoken about this a lot. That's how you know if it's a good being or a bad being trying to trick you into being a good being. They're they, They're coming from a place full of love. And they're not going to have you do anything against your free will. They're not going to allow you to hurt yourself or anyone else. They're going to give you a lot of space. They, they respect your free, free will. So they don't even come in and help you unless you ask for help, right? Because they respect your free will. All right. Any being, human or otherwise, who would possess your sovereign will is to be avoided. So any being trying to control you, and I just recently had that happen. I said, no, I didn't want to work with somebody anymore because I found out he was doing some shows about people who that weren't nice and weren't founded in any type of truth. They were like gossip shows and hearsay shows. And I said, I didn't want to work with this guy anymore. And I said, no, when I was, I was, um, try, they tried to manipulate me to tell me that I was ordered to do these shows by Trump shows. I wasn't paid to do it was strictly volunteer on my part. And um, I didn't, I just kept saying, no, no, no. Now, of course, there was blowback because I said no, but that's okay. There's protection. Don't worry. There's, there's authorities involved. So don't worry. Um, so yeah, so anybody who tries to gaslight you or control you in that way and manipulate you in that way, even if you are working for someone, you're being paid and your boss is wanting you to do something that you're not comfortable with, you still have the free will choice to say no. Okay. Boundaries are important. Lilith was in another electromagnetic spectrum. Many stories were told, but the encounters with Lilith were occurred in the astral realm where most, but not all, electromagnetic intelligence exists. Interesting. As with humans, these electromagnetic intelligence can move up into higher astrals and can also move beyond the astral into what some call the etheric plane, but we simply call the fifth dimension. Your universe is far stranger than you can imagine. Yes, I know. And that's interesting. I don't know how I feel about Lilith. I don't really have an opinion on her. Sometimes I research her and I'm like, oh, she's bad. Sometimes I research her, research her and I'm like, oh, she's misunderstood. She's actually good. So I don't know. I just don't have an opinion right now because I feel like I need more information. Um, and so I'm trying to really just kind of be in that place of not having an opinion. If I don't have all the information that I need to have and my gut's not really giving me anything, then I leave things, right? Like I just, I'll, I'll have an opinion at, at one point, but right now, no. And I think that's kind of an important lesson, right? It's the Aristotle quote. It's the, it's a sign of an intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. We can do that with people too. Like we can meet people or entities and not be sure whether they're good for us or bad for us and just kind of keep them there without forming an opinion until we're ready to form an opinion. I think that's really important. Now, if you meet somebody and you are immediately your gut is saying no, 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 then listen to that. But I do think we should also in situations like me with Lilith, like I just don't feel like I have enough knowledge to make um, an opinion. And I think sometimes the things we see about Lilith that are bad might just be propaganda. I don't know, though. We've learned that there's a lot of propaganda in the world right now. There's probably more propaganda actually in the truther community than there is in the normie community. That's a sad reality. Um, sometimes I think us in the truther community are way more duped than, than the normies. So, but anyway, before we get into the Octarian corridor, let's take a moment from a, for a brief word from our sponsors. 
If you are like me, then you love a good face mask. No, I kid you not. I have been obsessed with face masks since I was a teenager. I have memories of being in high school and having slumber parties with my girlfriends and trying different face masks. This has literally been something that I have been obsessed with my whole life. Now, the problem with me is that I have very dry skin. So I have to be very, very careful with the type of face mask that I use. Otherwise, it will dry my skin out too much and that in itself starts to cause some problems. Well, of course, ASEA just released its own face mask. It ran for a trial run last month and it looks like it's possibly potentially here to stay. Now, of course, once the mask was released and they were going to be doing the mask, I had to order one just so I could try it out because again, girl loves a good face mask. I was a little bit nervous. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I was a little bit nervous that it might dry my skin out. But nonetheless, I thought, what's the harm in trying? I've loved all of their face care system I've been using up until this point. So let's just try the mask. Well, true story. I got the mask in last week. And so that night when I got it in, I washed my face. I put this mask on, when you, which you leave on for about 10 minutes set my bath up, my, night, my nightly bath, put my Epsom salts in, all that kind of stuff, grabbed my murder mystery book. I'm always reading some murder mystery book. Got in the bath, soaked for like an hour, washed the face mask off, got out of the bath, did the rest of my skin routine, went to bed. Well, the very, very next morning, I was in the kitchen with my boyfriend. We were still in our pajamas super early in the morning, and he reached over, touched my face, and gave me a kiss, and he noticed that my face felt tight. Like, I had had, like, a facelift or like Botox overnight. Now he was not aware that I had done the face mask. He didn't even know that it had come in the mail the day before. And I said, interesting, I literally just did the ASEA face mask. And I went to look in the mirror and it had appeared overnight that my skin had tightened. Now, yes, I am 40 years old, so I'm kind of at that hinge age, right? I'm still young, but I'm moving into middle age. And so I am even more aware now about what I do to my skin as I enter into the latter part of my life. Since that first time using it, I've used it a couple of more times. And absolutely, I am feeling a difference. It really feels like I have had just someone pull the skin back. It's unbelievable. And so you can order the mask on its own. I actually have a couple more masks coming to me because I wanted to stock up. That's how good this mask is. Or you can get the bundle along with the brush. Personally, I have not used the brush, nor did I order the brush. I just use my hands. Or if you want, you can order a bundle of either your personal spa day with the with the lotion which i do have this lotion as well or you can come over here the ultimate gift for mom we know mother's day is coming up or if you just want to send your mom a gift because you know what you wouldn't be here without your mama or you could actually just order this for yourself but the mask again the mask is really something special because it really uh, after the first use i noticed a difference and so did my boyfriend so if this is something that you're interested in please look down in the description box below and you will see a link to the asia website where you can read more about the mask or all the other products that are offered by asia if you would like more information on ASEA, what the products can do for you, what products would be best for you, how to get ASEA at a wholesale price, then you can text Bryce Info, B-R-I-C-E Info, to 321-216-8047. Again, that's Bryce Info to the telephone number 321-216-8047. If you are texting from another country, please make sure you add plus one, 321-216-8047. Not sure if the mask is available in other countries just yet. I know they're planning on releasing it to other countries, but some of the other products are definitely available in other countries. So please just text Bryce Info to the number listed below. Again, all that information is down in the description box. The Octurian Corridor. Many have dis described a dimensional bridge between Octurians and your Earth. They call this the Acturian Corridor. For us, it is simply a stargate, an interdimensional portal that tunnels through the hyperspace and allows our vessels to enter not only the area of your Earth, 
but your entire solar system faster than the speed of light. This is a necessity when moving through such vast distances. The purpose of this Octarian portal is for our vessels to quickly move into position as needed. And by needed, I mean as determined by us. This stargate, this interdimensional tunnel is slowly for our vessels. It is not a means to connect with us except by rare individuals. When an individual has reached a level of understanding where he or she is ready and willing to make contact with an Acturian, the Acturian will create a micro tunnel, a smaller stargate, if you will, allowing the higher aspects, the higher dimensional bodies of the person to transit to the Acturian in some cases, or in some cases, the Acturian will transit to the human. This is also the means by which persons gain access to an Acturian vessel. This portal that some call the Octarian Corridor is not a naturally occurring vortex. It was created by us and it is sustained by us. It is part of our mission to protect life, intelligence, and freedom in this sector of the universe. This corridor, as some call it, is solely for the use of fifth dimensional vessels between Earth, your solar system, and Octarius. There are other Stargate tunnels from Octurius leading to other positions in your galaxy. Since this interdimensional tunnel, what some call the Octurian Corridor, is solely for the use of Octurian fifth dimensional starships, let me address the micro tunnels since these are applications to use by human beings. When an individual human is ready and willing to make contact, it is through one of these micro tunnels that such contact is established in most cases. These micro tunnels connect the higher dimensional bodies, especially the fifth dimensional bodies of the human to the Acturian and or the Acturian vessel through which contact is established. There are two categories I wish to discuss in regards to these micro tunnels. The first is the region of the body and the energy field where these micro tunnels make contact. The second category is the body-mind activity levels required for con conscious contact. Let us turn to the second category first. Contact between human beings and Octurians is usually confined to shift in perspective on part of the human. It would be highly unusual, rare, and unlikely for a human being to encounter an Octurian in the third dimension. This is because it takes tremendous energy to shift dimensions. It is therefore more expedient and efficient to adjust the body-mind complex of the human being in order to establish the micro tunnels of communication. We Acturians are, after all, a practical group, and we do not like to waste energy or resources. When a micro tunnel of communication is established, it, sh it shifts the brain state and physiological activity of the human being. In your scientific terms, there is an increase of alpha activity. But alpha activity is only one of the many brain states occurring during these communications. The human brain is very complex and multiple frequencies occur simultaneously within your brain. It is a simplistic and inaccurate to say that the higher states of consciousness are related to the higher brain frequencies. Exactly. This is a gross misunderstanding of the human physiology and potential. Absolutely. This goes back to what I, we were talking about in the beginning with Octura with the soul. So the brain, you know, we have these ideas, like we have the brain and we have the mind and we have consciousness, right? So the brain is the function of the mind, of, of the function of the, the organ of the brain, which is to keep us alive, to take in information, solve problems. Then we have the mind of the consciousness, which is kind of the overall energetic understanding of a person. In my opinion, the mind is a combination of the brain and the overall energetic experience of the human. Yeah. It's the tango between the Shiva and the Shakti, that dance between the nature and the, the soul or the Atman, right? When a micro tunnel is established between an Acturian and or Acturian starship and a human being, his or her perception spontaneously shifts. There is a great fluidity of perception and one becomes aware of at least two realities at once, the human reality and the higher dimensional reality where the interactions with the Acturian are taking place. In some rare instances, the individual will lose track of his or her third dimensional reality. The world will seem to disappear and he or she experiences the Octurian reality as the sole point of focus. In these moments, the human may conclude that he, she has physically been taken into an Octurian starship, 
but this is not the case. It is simply that the human brain was overwhelmed by the multi, 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 multi-dimensional, there's the word, nope, that's not the word, multi-dimensionality of the encounter and stopped tracking third dimensional reality. I'm actually reading this on a Sunday. I always pre-record these. And so I have been talking all morning because I taught a class this morning. Obviously, I teach classes every Sunday morning at Sacred Garden Yoga. Just a little plug here for Sacred Guard Yoga. If you would like to join me in those classes, if you do not live in Atlanta, Georgia, you can join me by practicing on Zoom. Um, we are on East Coast time. The class starts at 8.30 a.m. That's New York time. So um, I will put a link to that in the description box as well. But that's why my words are getting a little jumbled up. I've been talking all morning teaching classes. So, all right. For the individual human, this means that the brain and the mind are no longer receiving input from the five senses. The only input occurring is what is occurring in the dimension where the encounter is taking place. In some cases, a microtunnel is established by an Arcturian for the purpose of communicating with a specific human. In some cases, a microtunnel is established by a human to an Arcturian. These microtunnels are two-way streets, and it is possible to make contact with an Arcturian or some aspect of Arcturian reality through a conscious shifting of your brain and mind. I will return to this topic in, the, in a moment. But it will be better understood if we address the first category at this point in our discussion. These microtunnels move through hyperspace and connect into your energy field, what your ancient traditions call the aura, but more specifically into one or more of your chakras. Most humans who make contact with the Octurians do so through their third eye or crown chakra which means the microtunnel enters into one or more of these chakras and the subtle energies generated by these vor vortices, vortices, your chakras, are affected by the microtunnel. It shifts, it shifts gears, to use a metaphor, within your subtle energy body. And when this shift in your subtle energy body takes place, your brain and mind follow. Yeah, because the consciousness is what creates the shakti or the experience of the moment this shift in the subtle any energy body produces as i said an increase in alpha activity a relaxed state of awareness of the body as the micro tunnel increases its influence in the vicinity of the chakras there will be spikes of higher brain frequencies not just gamma but beyond gamma up into the higher thresholds of the brain when an individual experience himself or herself taking aboard an octarium vessel interdimensionally, one of these micro tunnels will connect to the navel chakra, which causes the entire subtle energy body to enter into resonance with the vibratory reality of the spaceship. Well, the second chakra is the one of creation, sexuality and creation. That makes sense. When this occurs, the human has two parallel experiences, being in the body on the spaceship, being in body and on the spaceship, being in body and on the starship simultaneously. At some point in the communication, the human being might experience himself or herself as a being solely on the starship. This has to do with shifting consciousness, awareness from the input of the body to the input of the higher dimensional body that is on the starship. When in this state of body and mind, the individual can receive much more information and gain tremendous knowledge in a short period of time. This is because our primary means of communication is holographic telepathy and not words. Thus, an individual human might experience himself or herself on a star ship for only a few moments in time as determined by the clock on your three-dimensional reality, but vast amounts of information and insight can be downloaded into the higher dimensional realities of the Octurian vessel. Realities. Baseline realities, parallel realities, alternative realities, and multidimensional realities. Let's explore the nature of these classifications. All classifications of perception are relative to the perceiver. All systems of knowledge, including science, are subject to revision. Any system or classification should facilitate the elevation of intelligence, not obscure it. Your embodied life in three-dimensional space is the baseline of your reality. This is because your nervous system references the world through your five senses. Your nervous system is tuned in to the specific vibratory le levels of your embodied existence. Failing to do so would end in your demise as a biological being. Survival is hardwired into your nervous system. It is the primary filter for sorting sensory information. Thus, your nervous system anchors you in, binds you to the third dimensional reality you live in. 
Inherent within your nervous system, however, is the capacity to experience other levels and other realities that are far beyond the constraints of your biological existence. Because you are a generator of quantum field activity, you affect subtle dimensional realities. What I mean by this is that when you take an action of the baseline of your existence, you set off repercussions at the atomic and subatomic levels and also in the more apparent levels of your life. Let me be a little bit more specific since this, this, this is a very abstract point. If you decide to change something fundamental in your life, you will set off multi-dimensional events. Let's say you decide to move to a new location. Obviously, at the third dimensional level, you will be moving things, your stuff as you call it, moving these things against the field of gravity, moving them to a new location in time and space. I say both time and space because your experience will be that you have moved objects through space to a new location. But you will also experience moving these through time because it will take a certain amount of your time to move your stuff. This is the New Newtonian reality of your embodied existence in the third level, which you call third dimensional reality. But let's look beneath the surface a bit, shall we? As soon as you have made the decision to move, your mind is already creating. You may have fantasies of where you are going with your stuff. How will you arrange your stuff in this new environment? You might even determine that you need to acquire new stuff. To an outside observer, it looks like this is nothing but creative fantasy. But from our perspective, as a quantum field generator, you are affecting the quantum realm through the power of your intention and focus. It's called manifesting. If you are an effective quantum field generator, and not all humans are by any account, you will facilitate the movement of your stuff in real time, clock time, through these creative fantasies. So let's say that you have decided to move and you have en engaged creative thinking about your new environment. You are shaping your new reality through the power of your mind in unseen ways. You cannot see how your mind affects the quantum reality, but you can see your stuff. It is not an either or proposition. Most of you will have to physically move your stuff or have someone else move it for you, but you can make you can affect the efficiency and the grace to some degree by how you think about it. Let's say that in your new environment, you will need a couch and you have none. And you create in your mind a fantasy of finding one at the yard sale. In another fantasy, someone gives you one as a gift. And in another fantasy, you, see you find a sale. In another fantasy, you find nothing and have to sit on the floor. From this perspective, you could say that each of these fantasies has the potential to generate a parallel reality. I say potential because idle thoughts do not create parallel realities. But if a pattern of thinking is strong enough, it will affect the quantum field, and then you will have a parallel reality running simultaneously within your baseline reality. An important point when considering parallel realities is the clear understanding that not all thought creates parallel realities. The thought must be sustained, it must be amplified, and it must be directed. Three. These three tasks are crucial to the creation of a true parallel reality, and most human beings are incapable of such tasks. It is not that they cannot learn how to do it, it's just that they tend not to apply themselves. I realize that many persons reading this material are interested in manifesting higher realities and are more evolved realities and situations in their life. How you address this challenge in your life will determine the quality of your life, the level of your intelligence, and how much freedom or imprisonment you experience. Every being, whether human or otherwise, must address this for him or herself. That's right, because no one is coming to save you. You have to save yourself. In hopes that it may be beneficial to you, I will share how most Octarians go, go about this task. The task is creating what we desire. First of all, we Octarians believe in the power of novelty. And all the, Octarian, and all the actions we take are undertaken with clear understanding that we live in a strange and paradoxical universe. We are persons of action. So the first fundamental movement for us is to take an action in some way. Our first action is always to intellectually assess the situation from as many vantage points as possible. We do this for two reasons. The first is to be as efficient as possible and comprehensive in our understanding. The second is to avoid the delusion of self-importance. Avoid the delusion of self. That's a lot of people need to hear that. A lot of people. There is a tendency for all beings, except for the most highly aware, to think that the world revolves around their choices. So when we consider our actions from many vantage points as possible, we get to see these possibilities and flaws in our plan. We Acturians quickly assess the course of action. 
We do not remain suspended in considering all choices. Once we have made a choice, it becomes a mission, and we will apply all of our resources to making our desires a reality through the combination of monitoring the situation, adjusting the situation as needing, and learning to com learning to com and leading to it to completion. During this entire process, no matter how long it takes, we continue to consider from other vantage points, knowing that we enter a situation with new information can change what we are doing. We also understand that we are affecting the quantum realm by being single-minded in our mission. We do not tend to wave or change our minds. We might change our approach, but this is done out of an intelligent discernment of the situation, not from a collapse of will. If there were anything I could say about humans and their challenges to create new outcomes and realities, it would be that the most fail to sustain their action long enough to see results. And from the level of quantum mechanics, they are unable to sustain the magnetizing thoughts that assist the outcome they desire. Alternative realities. Human beings have many selves. One of Some of these are positive in their intent and some can be quite negative. Think of it this way. If you have had a very nice day, you tend to be in a good mood. And this colors your perception of those around you and it colors how you see the world. It also shapes how you interact and the actions that you take. If on the other hand, you've had a very difficult day, you might be in a bad mood. The world looks very different to you when you are disgruntled. The world has not changed, but your emotional filter has. Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha, that's the second sutra of the first pada, the mind. It's the mind stuff. It's your mind is controlling everything. This is one of the main growth edges for human beings, how to manage their emotions and their emo emotional filters. From this way of looking at the things, there are many eyes. Each of the eyes has an emotional totality and a vibratory rate, and it creates a mental emotional reality. And this mental emotional reality affects how you perceive. It affects the action you take and ultimately affects your baseline reality to use this system as a reference. What I would say, would say is that your emotional filters are learned habits. And the mastery required in this level of your being is to choose the filter through which you wish to experience the world patterning we talk about that in yoga part of the yoga practice because the body is the shakti of the soul it's the expression of the soul so mental stuff the yoga chittam vritti nirodaha so the mental stuff the mind thoughts is creating specific patterns in the body that become habits and so part of the physical practice shifts those patterns create new patterns so the mind then creates new patterns all right it's interesting all these different lineages these different systems of spirituality are all really saying the same thing they're all saying the same thing Think of these emotional filters, these moods, as a team of horses. If they are running off in a different direction, you won't move very far. But if you bring them together in a constant vibratory rate, you can move them very powerfully. And when you move with power, you affect reality. The final category in this system is multidimensional realities. From this way of viewing things, multidimensional reality, multidimensionality, there we go, is simply the sum to total of all dimensions that you live in. The task, or shall we say, the opportunity for human beings is to become aware of their multidimensional reality. The irony is that they already possess it. You already have a multidimensional nature, but you have been confined and your perception has been trained to believe that third dimension is the only reality. We've talked in this many years ago, we did a whole breakdown on stories of the multiverse where People cross through from different dimensions. I will put those videos, if you miss them, down in the description box below. If this is a subject that's really fascinating to you. Because then you can actually hear folklore and legend about people crossing over from other dimensional realities. If you can be duped into believing that your physical life is all that there is. And that even if there is life after biological death, that you are confined to the will of some higher power. Then you have been cut off from the direct perception of yourself that is multidimensional. Your life as a human being is both terrestrial, earthbound, and cosmic. Meaning with access to the entire cosmos, you are transcendent to it all. This is a vast reality. It is part of your multidimensional nature. It is who you are. For most human beings, the first step is to undo the lies that they have been told. The other step is to, ha is to have a direct experience of your multidimensional reality multidimensionality there we go then it becomes not a question of faith but rather an intellectual certainty next week we'll start with anandra 
the Octurian Anandra. All right, you guys, leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below, and I will talk to you all soon.